Good morning. Welcome to New Earth Restoration Online Shabbat Service. For Sukkot, I think this is one, two, three, day four, a Shabbat. And tell me if you can hear me. Coming through loud and clear. Oh, excellent, excellent. We're at Marcio's house this morning, and we've had a, just a wonderful time of Sukkot here near the Smoky Mountains, the Great Smoky Mountains. And we visited the Smoky Mountains yesterday, and we went to a place called Cades Cove, where we could see some wildlife. And it was a nice trip through the mountains, and we did see some wildlife. We saw a flock of wild turkeys. Now I'm talking about the ones with the mm, thing on their face, that kind of wild turkey. And what else did we see? We saw some deer, of course. Ah, but we saw one other thing too. I can't remember what it is, but I can tell you what we didn't see. And that was elk. I wanted to see some elk, but they were not out today. They were celebrating Shabbat at the Elks Club. <laughs> That's the big joke for today. So before we go any farther, let's just say that we appreciate you all being on today. Uh, we have really missed you because this has been what appears to be a very long week. It's going slow and we're so happy it is. And I welcome you on behalf of Marcio and Trelly, and Bryant is here, and yours truly, and we're awaiting Kenneth's arrival. You should be here just about any time. We're going to go out back to the mountain uh, when this is over, and we're looking forward to that nice fresh air, beautiful weather out here. And getting some exercise once again, from which I am about <laughs> shot. But otherwise, I feel real good today, and I hope you do too. Is this not? Oh, it's good. Go ahead. Is not this the fast that I choose? That sounds good. You sound like you're coming from the cloud, and that, that's a good effect. Mm -hmm. To loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The radiance of Yahweh shall be your rear guard. We bless Yahweh and hear the cold shofar. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, sovereign of the universe. Who sanctifies us by your mitzvot and calls us to hear the cold shofar. We bless the Messiah. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, sovereign of the universe. Who has given us the way of escape and Messiah Yeshua. Amen. So with joy we draw living water from the springs of deliverance. We bless each other. On that day, Jacob blessed his grandchildren. He said, in time to come, the people of Israel will use you as a blessing. They will say, may Elohim make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. May Elohim make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. May Elohim make you like Sarah, Rivka, Raquel, and Leah. May Elohim make you like Sarah, Rivka, Raquel, and Leah. May Elohim bless you and watch over you. May Elohim shine his face toward you and show you favor. May Elohim be favorably disposed towards you and grant you peace. We enter the Kadosh. How lovely are your tents, O Yaakov, your dwelling places, Yisrael. 
Through your abundant favor, we will enter your home. In awe, we will bow down within your kadosh, kadoshi. We love the home you live in and the place where your radiance resides. We will fall and bow, bending the knee before Yahweh, our maker. May our prayers to you be at the appropriate time. In your abundant righteousness, answer us with the truth of your rescue. We favor Kin and Talmudim. May it be your will, Yahweh our Elohim, and Elohim of our foreparents, that you show favor to us and all our friends and relations, and that you grant us and all in Yisrael a good and long life, that you remember us with good thoughts and blessings, that you consider us with your salvation and your compassion, that you bless us with great gifts and favors, that you make our households complete, that you cause your presence to dwell among us at all times. Privilege us to train up our youth, proselytes, disciples, and all Talmudim in wisdom, understanding, in loving and revering Yahweh, and belonging to Yeshua, the Anointed One, and being committed to Him. Let them be people of truth, kadosh for Yahweh, to illuminate the world with Torah and Tob mitzvot, doing all in the service of Yahweh. Hear our supplication right now and give us the same favor as our spiritual mothers and fathers. Cause our light to shine as a reflection of your face for all ages, so that all Israel might be saved. Amen. We recite the Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his esteemed kingdom forever. And you will love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. Let these words be upon your heart. You will teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk upon the path, when you retire, and when you arise. And you will bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And you will write them on the doors and gates of your house, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. We give thanks and praise. And here we go. No one has as much reason to thank and praise Elohim than me. Uh, this week, I did more walking than I've done in at least five years. Honestly, it's like a miracle. I know I've said this before and reiterated it probably three times now, but I surprised myself. Uh, being able to walk up and down the hills of this place without pain and without any suffering whatsoever. And I'm so thankful. I wonder if I've had a miracle. Well, see what Elohim tells you. If he gives you a word on this, then please let me know. I don't want to go back to that pain. I'm sure you understand. But since we got here, and since we spent the time in the last month getting prepared, he's gone. How about you? Do you have a testimony of what Elohim has done for you this week? Hey, just a comment on that, Jackson. I, I was actually thinking that. I said that uh, to someone uh, this week. I said, wow, Jackson looks really active. Uh, by pictures that you were sending out, some really beautiful pictures. Thank you for those as well. But I think the Father has done a miracle. And maybe it has something to do with that new wife, that wonderful wife that you've married, uh, that she's kind of uh, helped and used some help to your bones, uh, you know. Uh, and so uh, I'm very, very thankful uh, for the Almighty for that. Amen. Certainly that's true what you said. She's a wonderful person. Anybody else?
Shalom. I want to praise Yahweh, and, and that's wonderful to hear. And I, I agree. You know, I believe it's a miracle. I believe that he's healing your body, and I believe it may have something to do with your wonderful wife there that, you know, the two become one and, and you share things together. But, you know, great to hear. And I just want to praise him that Stephanie's, you know, getting up and doing more in the last, oh, probably two or three days. She's more like returning to herself instead of the, the tiredness and the different things that have been going on. So we just want to praise him that, you know, she's up and moving and she's walking because she had a problem too. She couldn't walk uh, at one point, probably 20, 30, 40 feet. I mean, she just, her energy was gone and everything. So now she's actually been able to get out, you know, outside a little bit. And, and the sun was actually a problem. It burned her there for a while, but you know, just want to praise Yahweh. She's actually up and moving, and and she didn't even have a nap, I think. She usually was taking a nap, I'm going to tell on her. She usually had to have a nap throughout the day because she was tired and everything, and she's actually getting through that. So we just want to give him all the praise that she's up and moving, and, and just can't praise him enough, you know. Just wake up and praise him and, and praise him in the evening that we're still here. We're still alive. We still have the opportunity to Breathe that wonderful air and just give you all the praise. Man, mega amen. Mega right. amen. That is so wonderful to hear you from week to week talk about the recovery of Stephanie. And yes, we're all glad in the heart. I just want to pray right now briefly about this. We thank you, Father, for giving us back our youth. As you promised in your scripture, one of the great promises, that we would be youthful again and that we would return to the state that we once was, where we could run and play and be happy again. Oh, we thank you. We know that in this world, devils are filling this world and we are under a great deal of pressure. But give us the strength of youth to fulfill the commission that you have given us to go out and teach and to make disciples for Yahshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. Anybody else? Or a prayer request? A psalm? Yaakov? Need a new microphone, brother. Can't hear you. Sorry. Wish we could. Miss Valerie. Prayer Hi, for Valerie. her in law. She's supposed to deliver this week. If she doesn't by Friday, they're going to put her in for a C section. Who is that? Vicky? No, my daughter in law. Oh. Heather, Sean's wife. Yes, I remember her. Yeah. So is would that be a good thing? Well, because of her size, a C-section is going would be very difficult on her. Mm -hmm. So we're praying that she delivers naturally this week, at least by Friday night. Either he's going to try and induce. If it doesn't work, he's going to C-section. All right. The doctor is known for C-sections. Father, lay your hands upon her and Sean. And bring forth that child naturally if it's possible. If you deem that she needs to be C-sectioned, we pray that you would be with the surgeon during that time and bring forth a healthy baby. We're just going to stand on that. In the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, amen. Amen. Who else? Yako, now you're going to try. Okay, I'm going to try again. I got my mic plugged in. Yeah, are you hearing now? Me? Are you getting a signal now? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, first off, I want to uh, I want to thank. Uh, there's been a couple of people who have sent letters to Brother Henry in prison. He has uh, communicated with me this week that that's been very uplifting for him, and and I I just great greatly thank. Um, those who have done so, especially during this time, because he feels so secluded, not being able to keep Sukkot 
not being able to keep the feast days in the way that the scriptures prescribe. So uh, just continue to lift him up in prayer as well as others who are, who are incarcerated, whether they be in the Grafton prison or whatever is, was um, incarcerating them, whether they're in prison uh, or a steel prison or a prison of their own mind. Um, just pray for each and every one who are, who are being um, held back at this time. I also want to give a, a praise report for the ability to get my, my video back, but it seems that I have a choice, either video or audio. So I have to plug in a, a microphone to get my audio as long as I have my video. But I am thankful that I have both now. And I ask for your special prayers for Brother Greg's father. He and I are supposed to travel down to Virginia to keep the Sukkot. Um, he took a test, a COVID test, and it was positive. Oh. I think that was two days ago um, or yesterday. I'm not sure which one. He's supposed to take another test today. We advised him to that, that sometimes they are um, negative po or positive, negative, however you term that. So uh, I just pray that he is well enough, that he is looking forward to coming to Sukkot. He has been listening to a, a Torah observant pastor in the Detroit area, and I'm hoping that he will come around to this way of life as well. Amen. Amen. Well, I think that we will find that uh, COVID is not as bad at least for some people, as the cure. And so we pray that he doesn't have COVID and that he can enjoy the Sukkot with his friends and family. Lift him up, Father. Daddy Smith, Yah bless him, so that they can all go and have exactly the same kind of anointing and even fun that we've been having here. Amen. Let's remember... The nation of Haiti, they're in a terrible mess right now. Gangs have just taken over, no government, and our brother Finney is scared. And we sent a draw of money down there last week, and that money has not arrived. We sent it down by, by wire, and it's just disappeared. Now they're trying to trace it. But they're hungry down there, and they need some help. Remember that in your daily prayer, we ask you. See, we ask you. More than that, I've been feeling so guilty about this because we're feasting and they are fasting. Anything else? Emerson, you usually have something. Can you hear me, Brian? Yes. Uh, so one blessing I can tell you, though, is, uh, you know, there's different methods that we're able to send funds over there. So thankfully, there's an alternative that's to uh, the current banking system. And uh, I'm referring to uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. So hallelujah, we were able to send funds to him to help. Uh, we've done it a couple times now to help. Uh, you know, help make sure they're eating something at least in the meantime while the, the, the bank wire goes through. So it is a whole different kind of method, though, for them to, like, cash out the Bitcoin into their local currency. Uh, but the good thing is that it seems to be uh, a smaller fee. It only takes about 10 minutes to an hour or so to get there. Depends on how busy the network is. And then a blessing is uh, instead of it being, like, $50, it only costs, like, $2. and depends on how busy the network is. And uh, on his end, he has a brother that's a really awesome brother, Rico. Definitely want you all to keep him in prayers, too. Uh, and he has a motorcycle. And once we send him some of the, the, the Bitcoin, there's an app that he's able to, like, transfer the Bitcoin into gourds. But he has to go and find a local office. Mm. So that's where the difficulty has lied in the past. He's just trying to find an office, which took him a couple of days before. 
Uh, right now, my, to my knowledge, he's having issues with his motorcycle. So hopefully he's got that fixed so they can get around. But we were able to send some just a couple days ago. So I haven't heard right. an update, hopefully. Hopefully they were able to make it turn into some gourds and turn into some food and water and feed some of the orphan kids and the, the brothers and sisters and the 81-year-old brother Maestro, who sends you sal salutations, brother brother uh, Jackson. And congratulations on your marriage to you. Thank you. I talked to him a couple of days ago. Thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, looking over the statement, they're now charging 90 five dollars to do a wire so that's insane that is yeah. so that's so wrong like it's so demonic. it's called remittance when people send money to foreign countries and it's very common for people come from the philippines or from haiti you know and they can work a, a job here and what they make here is months worth of pay over there what they can make here in, in weeks so they send it back home but unfortunately western union and the banking system makes a killing off of the fees mm -hmm. and it's robbery. It's a shameful robbery for them to steal money from people that don't even have. And literally they're using an old legacy system to transfer the money around. So it takes days. And here we have technology that's only 13 years old it's called the Bitcoin blockchain. It can get there in 10 minutes. And that's one of the things I was talking with brother Rico and he's really interested in brother Fene is too. And it's like trying to get uh, more of the Haitian people there that have access to like cell phones to, to utilize uh, the blockchain instead of utilizing the banking system. That's one of the great benefits of it. It helps the unbanked. Yeah. It's really, there's billions of people in the world that cannot get a banking account in our current system because the current system doesn't consider them worthy. They can't perform or, you know, create all the forms of identity and then they're always worried about everyone's a terrorist. If you're not American, practically now they're hmm. accusing Americans of being terrorists. It's like crazy the way that the banking system is. And you can see it's been weaponized. They turn it off against Russia. Just totally cut them off of everything. So it's nice to know there's an alternative out there. Uh, he shall restore sevenfold. We need to stand on that promise. We need to stand upon it every day, at least for these people overseas that have such great needs. Thank you, Brother M. All right, uh, will you join me in prayer? This prayer is called Hahodia, and that means Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving. We thank you, our set-apart Father, for your Kadosh name that you have caused to dwell in our hearts and for the knowledge, faithfulness, and eternal life that you've made known to us through your servant, Yeshua. Yours is the kavod forever. O Yah of legions, you created all things for the sake of your name. You gave nourishment and drink for human beings to enjoy in order that they would give thanks to you. You also bestowed upon us spiritual nourishment and drink and eternal life through your servant. And for all things, we thank you because you are powerful. Yours is the kavod forever. Remember, O oh Yah, your congregation, your Yahad, to rescue her from all evil and to make her complete in your love. Gather the betrothed from the four winds to your kingdom that you have prepared for her. For years again is the koach and kavod, haolam vaid. May grace come, and may this world pass away. Hoshana to Elohim of Dawid, everyone who is kadosh, let him come. Everyone who is not, let him repent. Maranatha, our master is coming. Amen. Amen. That comes from our seal, and we used that wonderful prayer last night, and you'll see in the message today just how important a prayer like this is. Amen. Tyson? Oh, that's me.
Hmm. We hear the word and testimony. Let the, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Let the prophets prophesy. Ah, uh, double amen. Let's give it a try. The title of this message is The Evolution of Some Dark Acts. In the last couple of days, I've run across some statistics that really bowled me over uh, about something that I had approved of earlier, but Professor Smith, he corrected me and I looked into it a little more. And that is recombinant DNA technology and transhumanism, thank you for correcting me. Text comes from the Yahad rule in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yahweh Elohim created humans to rule over the world, appointing for them two spirits in which to walk until the time set for his visitation. I think you'll probably think that this is pretty familiar. Yes, it is. These are the spirits of truth and falsehood. An upright nature and destiny originate in the territory of light. A perverse nature originates in the fountain of darkness, light and dark, good and evil. The authority of the prince of light extends to governing of all righteous people. That word governing is important. So, of course, they walk in the paths of light. Likewise, the authority or dominion of the angel of darkness grips the government of all vile people. So naturally, they walk in the paths of darkness. Yet the Elohim of Israel and the Malik of his truth aid all the children of light. Amen, Father. Allow these words to be a burning torch in the hearts and minds of the hearers. Amen. I don't need to tell you that there's been an ongoing duel between good and evil that's been waging for centuries. On one side, there are those who believe in a higher power, and that humankind was made in the image of Elohim, a figure who we understand to be immutable or unchangeable. Likewise, this image is not to be trifled with or corrupted by human beings. The children of light believe that the only way humans can better themselves is to look to Elohim for refinement and improvement and spiritual life. But on the other side are these children of darkness who deny the existence of Elohim and believe that humans are the supreme intelligence in the universe, that human form and destiny are malleable and can be shaped and improved through manipulating the image. Since there are really no moral constraints with these, natural leaders will arise and to see to this mutilation and manipulation, and that they will be able to build better men and women through this type of meddling, meddling with creation, all creation. Of course, it's our intention to help to restore the creation rather than meddle with it and ruin it. Our text tells us that the first camp is good and the second is evil. Or more in more symbolic terms, it's called light versus dark. Humans have been arguing about defining and redefining what it means to be good ever since the angels first fell. The ancients tried to define the battle as normal versus different, or knowledge versus ignorance. Later, right versus wrong in the context of defining law and justice. 
societies and governments were organized around these old dark concepts. Most Americans and most people in general have an innate understanding of what is evil, it seems. Some refer to this as a conscience. Even some of the people in the dark camp who believe that humans are the supreme beings have vestiges of conscience informed by religion and experience of their past, nature and nurture, but only vestiges. The vast majority either are or seem to be spiritless humans. Where is that spirit of light in common humans? Total, uh, sorry. Governments have formed to reflect, monitor, and control the cultural norms of the people governed. Logic dictates that those governments would also implement and enforce those cultural norms based on different philosophical frameworks, partly as shaped by the respective religious philosophies and various ideologies that have been developed over the centuries including monarchical rule, that is kings, Marxism, fascism, socialism, communism, capitalism, patriarchy, oligarchy, etc. Totalitarian ideologies that were developed in the 19th and tested during the 20th century, particularly fascism and communism, denied the existence of Elohim so that the governments formed would be unconstrained by religious and moral boundaries. These perversions arising from the experimentation include the following, most of which you'll be familiar with. In Germany, the Nazis were obsessed with false racial theories that resulted in a classification system. You know the concept of race is not scientific, and it's not biological either. There really is but one race. What we need to talk about, or these people need to talk about when it comes to race, is simply skin color. The so-called Aryans of that time were considered to be the master race. And at the top of the human pyramid, and destined to rule the world, Jewish people and certain others, well, I'd say probably like us, were on the lowest level, considered to be rats and vermin of society. Nazism was organized around this irrational concept to develop and promote those with the purest Aryan blood at the expense of those with lesser classifications. Boys were educated, inculcated, and groomed with Nazi principles, and very effectively, I might add. Girls were brainwashed through other programs for being good domestic servants and mothers. In Russia, Soviet man was to be the ultimate proof that communism worked and that humans could evolve for better without the guidance of Elohim. The communists tried to shape individual consciousness, character, and social practices in order to get the people to conform to the Marxist view of the perfect citizen. The Soviets experimented with telepathic research, cybernetic stimulations, and mass hypnotism through television, to control the minds of their citizenry. These practices developed into the concept of, and listen, mass formation psychosis, which is being exploited by globalists in America today. Mass formation psychosis. Please look that up sometime soon. In China, the Communist Party, or the CCP, has controlled education there for a hundred years to indoctrinate students at all levels in atheistic Marxist ideologies, principles, history, racial theories, 
global objectives, and most importantly, conditioning everyone to acquiesce to the party's control of all aspects of society. I wish that there was time to give you some examples and, and some other things here, but just so much time. The leader of China recently said, we need to strengthen political guidance for young people, guide them to voluntarily insist on the party's leadership, to listen to the party and follow the party. All citizens of China worldwide are being monitored by the party no matter where they live, to see that every citizen here and there and everywhere conforms to its dark directives. So to form the perfect communist, or should I say dark world. Communist values greatly influence the American Democrat party of today with one great difference. These leaders in America fervently claim to be religious, to hold active church membership, to pray and communicate with the great power. They claim to be Christians, but they are not. They are dark, exemplified by the 63 million babies aborted in the last 50 years. You will know them by their works. These 19th century theories bore bad fruit in the 20 and 21st centuries, and they didn't work. Karl Marx's theories begot the Communist Manifesto, which some of us were made to read back in school days. Those of the Communist Manifesto's atheistic adherents, they continue to plague the world. Darwin's theory of evolution began eugenics, which the Genome Research Institute defines as, and I quote, an immoral and pseudoscientific theory that claims it is possible to perfect people and groups through genetics and the scientific laws of inheritance. Eugenics was and is particularly evil. Its adherents include the Nazis and the Americans and the Committee of Eugenics and the American Eugenics Society, which study selective and restricted human breeding. Democrat President Roosevelt promoted Nazi eugenicists to positions in government. The Nazis used eugenics to justify the sterilization and elimination of undesirables, including Jews, homosexuals, gypsies, Slavs, and some whole Christian sects. Eugenics theories led directly to the Nazi genocide that eliminated millions of useful citizens in the 1930s and 40s. Eugenics was also the basis of the sterilization laws in more than 30 United States states. With some of these laws on the books clear up through the 80s and still are practiced today. Over 60,000 idiots, imbeciles, promiscuous, and feeble-minded were murdered in the 20th century. That's in the United States. More lately, such research could have killed off the entire world with the manufacture of SARS and COVID, and COVID eugenics projects. Now it's looking like those vaccination cures of man-made chimeras may eventually kill everybody because thousands of people have died and more are dying or doomed to death by the cure. Check the alternative news sources and see for yourself. Make sure that your sources are justified. The hero of the choice movement today, eugenicist and racist Margaret Sanger, she founded the Birth Control League of 1921 and its successor, Planned Parenthood, in 42. She supported eugenics initiatives. 
that was in my district. Thank you, Greg. She supported eugenics initiatives, including the sterilization of people with mental and physical disabilities. Prostitutes and criminals, and really anyone that they wanted, would be segregated into concentration camps. And for instance, paupers, drug addicts, and the unemployed, plus mandatory birth control for mothers with diseases. Choice wasn't a part of the equation. It is to be no choice. Another of Sanger's initiatives was the Negro Project, in which predominantly black neighborhoods were targeted for birth control programs. Its purpose was evident, as she later disclosed, we don't want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Unquote. Planned Parenthood, if you didn't already know, is one of the main organizations behind the passage of Roe versus Wade in 1973. The U.S. Supreme Court decision claimed that a woman's right to an abortion was implicit in the 14th Amendment, the Privacy Amendment. At first, Planned Parenthood advocated that abortion should only be rarely performed such as in rape or incest, or to save the mother's life. But once the federal government funded Planned Parenthood's abortion clinics, the money pushed the boundaries of abortion from within the first trimester to partial birth abortions, in which a child is halted halfway through the birth and destroyed with a scissor to the neck. So simple abortions have evolved to infanticide, and infanticide is absolutely barbaric. You know that the Nazis committed genocide by killing the six million or more Jews? Communist China has committed genocide against two million Uyghurs, not to mention all the other people. However, these numbers pale in comparison to the 63 million babies murdered in the United States by abortion since 1973. That number includes over 19 million Black babies. And do Black lives matter? Do any lives matter to these leftists but their own? The newest effort is the dark transhumanism movement that wants to accelerate human evolution through advanced genetic technologies. It's a, an easy segue from eugenics because it aims to enhance human species through biological and physical technologies, or as one encyclopedia put it, quote, to augment or increase human sensory reception emotive ability, or cognitive capacity, as well as radically improve human health and extend human life spans. <laughs> that's, that's really something. Indeed, good things could come out of eugenics. As I've taught before, they certainly could. But how do technologies originating, originated by dark Nephilim possibly do good in the end. We have the story on that from the prophet Enoch, seventh from Adam. In short, the goal is to create superhumans who will live forever. And just like <laughs> eugenics, there's no natural selection involved, but a rather selective implementation. And for those willing to pay the cost, not you, not me, the cost both in money and the results of experimentation as we are daily learning. There's never an end to it until we do something. Elohim versus humankind, good versus evil, dark versus light, a struggle that will end either when there are no humans left at all or the eternal puts a stop to it. 
to save the righteous. First came eugenics, then abortion on demand and infanticide. And now there's a new horizon posed by transhumanism. All our dark arts and sciences all have evolved and are evolving toward greater and greater and greater evil. None of them have moral, ethical, or religious constraints, and all are arbitrary as determined by those who hold the power, probably the least qualified of all. The Biden administration has cleared the decks for transhumanism through the signing on September 12th of the Executive Order on Advancing Biotechnology and Biomanufacturing Innovation for Sustainable, Safe, and Secure American Bioeconomy. Into the brave new world we go, and now with much trepidation. What can you do? You can get educated. You can speak up. You can command the evil to cease. You can pray, 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 if you can pray. Or you can read about it. Look for those alternative news sources that use verifiable data. Talk about it. Expose it. Vote against it, no matter what party. Condemn it, because the onus is on the children of light now, and the most powerful force in the world, Yahweh our Elohim. Mika Mocha, the only thing that can stop us is our stupefying ignorance and lack of action. I want to end up here by reading a couple verses of a rather familiar hymn with the words being written by, of all people, a racist named Martin Luther. But listen to these words before he came became such. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, that man of Yah's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Yeshua, Moshiach, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we'll not fear, for El hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness, grim. We tremble not for him. His wrath we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Oh, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. El's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Amen. I'm sorry. Can you we see now? Better. Our, our Father in the sky, may your name be sanctified. May your reign be blessed. Your will be done in sky and land. Continually give us our bread. Forgive us our sin debts as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Do not bring us into the nets of a snare and protect us from the evil one. Amen. The Pledge of Allegiance. 
I pledge allegiance to the Torah. I pledge allegiance to the Torah. Of the kingdom of the beloved son. Of the kingdom of the beloved son. And to the divine theocracy for which it stands. And to the divine theocracy for which it stands. One Eloha, one nation, one head. One Eloha, one nation, one head. One faith, one attitude, one goal. One faith, one attitude, one goal. One baptism, one communion. One baptism, one communion. Ordained by Yahweh the Creator. Ordained by Yahweh the Creator. My nation is indivisible. My nation is indivisible. With divine liberty and equitable justice. With divine liberty, equitable justice. And eternal life for all. Amen. And eternal life for all. Amen. The leader blesses. Now Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. In the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, Prince of Peace, Amen. Amen. The service is finito. Thank you so much for being here today. It's always great to have <laughs> some folks to worship with on the Shabbat, and especially a Shabbat in the middle of a feast. So we're going to turn it over now to Brother Greg, Professor Smith, and uh, we'll see what happens next. Again, thank you for your presence and for your anointing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brother Jackson. What a wonderful service. I am very encouraged. Uh, it's just amazing. We have such a wonderful group of people. We come together. And even during a Sukkot where people are kind of, uh, you know, they're camping, they're, they're not, they, they might not have all the technological um, things that they might have at home, but we still were able to come together and uh, uh, according to the will of Yahweh and get a great service out. Thank you so much for that message, uh, Brother Jackson. And a very, very uh, impacting uh, message and very relevant for today. Uh, I, it, you know, uh, as I was thinking about what you were uh, teaching, this is in Isaiah chapter 59, 19. We always want to leave people with a, a promise that Yahweh gives us uh, that uh, no matter how much evil the devil piles into the world, guess what? Yahweh has a plan and his his plan is greater than the devil's. And this is what it says. So shall they fear the name of Yahweh from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of Yahweh shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59, 19. And that's a promise we have today, my friends. And let's hold on to that and await the deliverance of the master Yahushua, and he will do great and mighty things in the earth. And if we think that Egypt and the plagues that came upon the, the, uh, that nation and the great and mighty miracles and signs that were done during that time, if we think that was great, hold on to your hats. We're going to see some powerful, powerful deliverances in these days. As we are in the days of Noah, uh, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, and great and mighty things will be done. And we are on the cusp of it, my friends. And so let's ask the Father to give us the direction to minister to those hungry souls when they see these fearful things coming across uh, the earth. Let us have the hope the hope of the Master Yeshua to give them so that they can turn to him, repent, and believe upon his mighty name. Well, that's exciting, man. That's exciting. You ought to keep going. Amen. Baruch Hashem. So, my friends, uh, so we're going to open up our um, time here for some thoughts in uh, Psalms or anything else we missed in prayer. 
or any discussion about perhaps even the sermon that was delivered uh, or anything else that's on your mind. So uh, if anybody has anything they would like to share, uh, let's let's open the floor now. Okay, we got Brother Holsapple and Brother Yako. Uh, Brother uh, Holsapple, you, can you go first and then Brother Yako? Okay. Yes, that was a great message. Great, you know, but I, I believe that a lot of times when we hear these things and we see everything going around us and <clears throat> just so much death and destruction that if we're not careful, we can get complacent and think that we're done, you know, that's over, we're, we're on the ground. We're already beat up and, you know, we just feel so bad for everything going on. But, you know, we're not done. He's not done. Just like you said, that we know we live in a terrible, evil, dark world. And we know that a lot of people out there are, you know, they do a lot of dark things, a lot of evil things. But greater is he that is in me than is in this world. So I believe that we still have many things we can see. I think there's so many blessings. And I think the darker this world gets, the more our light is truly going to shine, that we should be shining. We should be helping and showing, you know. And when we was in Alabama, there was so many people. Uh, I put some of it on Facebook. There's so many people out there that they're just in the streets. They're homeless. They're lost. They don't know what to do with themselves. And that same attitude, I think, rolls over that they just give up, if you will. You know, they lose a job or they lose this or they lose something. So they just kind of give up and they're on the streets. There's no way out. They can't do anything. And, you know, they just kind of rolls them over. But to talk with them and let them know and, you know, Yahweh still loves you, that he still cares, that he can still change this around in an instant. If you would just believe, you know, all we got to do is is grab that that garment, you know, that seat seat, if you will, and sometimes hang on and know that in a time it, it's coming that he will change those things. But we have to be faithful. We have to be true. And we just have to keep pushing forward and know that that time is his timing. You know, we all want it to happen right now. But I do believe that we're going to see some amazing things happen. I believe even if it's at an individual level for people and families, but just a whole family changing that, you know, gets reunited, that gets put back together, that it's just amazing to see that and to see people that actually do turn to Yahweh and understand that he wants them to have an abundant life. He wants us to have you know, not the riches and the things, but he wants us to have a good life. And I think a lot of people, they just get so down with everything going on. And that dark force is trying to, you know, program and tell you that it's all over. It's done. You might as well quit. But we can't quit, brothers and sisters. We got to keep moving. We got to keep going forward. And as long as we have breath, praise Yahweh. That's all I have. Hallelujah. Very good, brother. Thank you for that encouraging word. Very mm -hmm. good. And, and you're right, brother. Very encouraging. And let us uh, fix our eyes above, not on the earth or on the wind and waves around us, but we will walk on water too if we keep our eyes and our attention fixed on the Master Yahushua. Brother Yaakov, what do you have for us today? Well, I greatly appreciate what Brother Halsapple has just said because it's so true. We have to be watching intently what's going on around us, but keeping our focus on Yah and his Torah, the lifestyle that Mashiach gave us to witness to this world to live. But I would caution everybody because there are amazing things coming, but we also know that Hasatan has amazing things that he is going to deceive this world with. Um, one of the things that I'm very concerned about right now is the direction that they're taking AI in. Um, I'm very worried that when we read about the beast power and he sets up an image, I have 
uh, I have a very deep feeling that that image is going to be AI. And so we must be very careful about what we are in, um, in awe of and just watch out and pray and help our, our family to understand this because Satan's, these, Satan's dividing this world. He's dividing it in sexes. He's dividing it in races. He's dividing it in uh, immoral practices. And now he's, he, he's even dividing it in our families. And so as we see these times drawing near, we need to be drawing closer to our families and helping them to see and understand that these things are prophesied and they're not to be uh, taken lightly. That We need to be on our toes constantly and, and preparing, um, preparing ourselves, preparing our families for the times of trial and tribulation that we're about to face. Thank you for that, brother. Yes, preparing, preparing. The Bible tells us uh, that the wise see the trouble ahead and prepare for it, but the foolish pass on and are punished. And so uh, however, with, however that the Father is leading you to prepare, obey him, if it's your heart, if it's your spiritual uh, condition, get right with him. Uh, if if you have a ability to perhaps the father's leading you to store up food or water or um, whatever it may be, uh, he he gives certain directions to his servants, and our responsibility is to be sensitive to his spirit and to manifest in our lives what it is the father would have us to do. And so uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, very encouraging words, brother. Uh, we have some text down here. Uh, we have, thanks a lot for your encouragement words, brother. This is from Honoré uh, uh, Jean Finet. It was a pleasure to be there with you. Having a chance to be in Yahweh's presence, the best gift we could have in life. Wish all of us would keep these advices in our heart. We will walk like Abba Yahweh wants. Wish to all of you to have a great week and be blessing. Shalom, shalom. Thank you, Honoré. Thank you. Uh, Donna and Bob have a comment. Could you comment on why the second goat had to be sent to Azazel? Yeah, very good uh, subject there, uh, Donna. And I think we do have some learned people here that can comment on that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, what uh, she's talking about is that during the Yom Kippur service, um, they would have the, the, the uh, lamb that was slaughtered and then would have the scapegoat. And uh, during that service, the high priest would lay hands on the goat and would pray a prayer and commute the corporate and collective sins of Israel upon the scapegoat, at which, at which time then the servants of the temple would lead that goat off into a far wilderness place. And tradition says that they would push it off a cliff and it would fall down and die. Uh, but that at the time of commuting those sins, uh, that the high priest would would utter the words uh, "Let Azazel" for Azazel, and uh, as we know in the book of Enoch, uh, Azazel uh, was the uh, one of the uh, offspring of the fallen angels, and it was uh, Azazel was a figure that symbolized the corruption of what the fallen angels had done. And according to the book of Enoch, they came down 200 strong of them upon Mount Hermon, and they made a pact among them. They saw this pristine, beautiful creation uh, that Almighty Yah had created. And so they made a pact among themselves to go down and muddy the pristine, pure waters, so to speak. And what and their then their their <coughs> their plan was to have sexual relations with human women and produce an offspring that was corrupt on the earth. They were it was Satan's it was Satan's plan to destroy this beautiful creation that Father Yahweh put on the uh, on the earth and Azazel. Is was the offspring, the firstborn offspring of that, and so when 
The high priest lays his hands upon the scapegoat. He is essentially saying and, and communicating that Yahweh, through his uh, divine intervention, will undo that corruption in the earth. This also connects to Genesis, where it says the Almighty, uh, where literally uh, there's a prophecy that says, that the serpent shall, um, how does that go? It's in, uh, who knows what I'm talking about? It's in Genesis where it says that the, the heel will crush the head of the serpent. That's connected to Azazel as well. Uh, does anybody else have thoughts on that? Um, that was a good question there, Donna. Thank you. Uh, anything else, uh, that, uh, thoughts on that? Um, that's the best I can answer that. Let me see if I can find that while, uh, See, uh, go ahead, brother. Yeah, go ahead and comment on that, and I'll see if I can find that scripture while you're coming. Right. I mean, you're absolutely right there, but I, I see that's uh, it, what we see today as well. Instead of the, uh, you know, what happened there, I think that's what the enemy is trying with these different, you know, AI programs with different jabs with different, you know, they're we're just guinea pigs trying to do the same thing all over again. We're just, you know, try to corrupt the DNA, try to corrupt the blood, uh, you know, so many things. And some of it, they're just telling us, you know, like this, you know, the different uh, things that they're using, the different, like Roundup and, the, you know, the different things causes our DNA to change. There's something in it that, and most people just don't care or they just don't seem to care. You know, they're taking this stuff and taking in our food. I mean, there's so much that they're putting into things. And then again, you know, we if you study all these different shots and different things and what they're putting into them and different mercury and different stuff. And there's a lot of people that even say that their kids was healthy and fine until they took these shots. And now they have, you know, signs of autism and all these different problems coming up that I believe it's the same thing, just in a different kind of form that, you know, they come to muck it up the waters, like you said, to just destroy, you know, to be made in the image of Yahweh is something important. I think that's another thing that we cannot reduce or forget that, you know, being made in the image of Yahweh, I mean, praise Yahweh, what else can you ask for? You know, we are, to be made in that image and to be a part of that, I think is just so beautiful and wonderful. And the enemies must think that very much same thing because they want to destroy that image, that blood, that the cellular, you know, even down to the, the cell level and trying to just corrupt us and make us terrible. So what kind of a power would we be? Can we be being united? You know, it, just like uh, Brother was saying there, you know, that separation, separation, you see a lot of separation and where two or three are gathered in my name. If we could come together and pray and do these things together, just a few of us, what kind of power can we change? What kind of things can we go and even pray, you know, go to Washington, D.C. or go to these places, blow the shofar and pray. And uh, I, I put it on Facebook there when I first when we first got we could actually get outside <laughs> there in uh, Birmingham. There's all kinds of statues and, and vulgar things and everything. And when I first came out, there was actually a witch with tarot cards on like right across from this Baptist church. And it just bothered me that there's this huge Baptist church here and there was people filling it up and there's this witch <laughs> sitting on the street. I mean, on, uh, I don't know if she was on the phone or what she was doing. I think she was on the phone and she was actually like reading these cards and telling these people and it just didn't sit well with me at all. And I was like, this don't belong here. I, you know, I'm not going to put up with this. We can't we can't have this. This is just, you know, and the, the homeless people are getting worse because that demonic is taking them over. And then, you know, they go and try to kill themselves and cut themselves. So anyway, I blew the show far, prayed about it. And the next day she was gone. The rest of the time that we was there, 
she was gone. So I don't think we realize the power that we have. You know, Yahweh has instilled this power upon us, and he has said that you will do these things. We just can't let them take that strong hold and, and do what we can as long as we can, you know, to keep those evil darkness away, to keep that out. And it helps other people. I know some of the people there, when we came back, when I came back, we could actually talk to them and they made sense as opposed to when that first happened, this one guy, his name was Brad, he he didn't make anything intelligent thought. His whole thought process was just not there. And it wasn't a couple of days, you know, and pray and blow the show far and and, you know, I like, no, we're cleaning up this street. It, it, nothing else why we're here. What happens when we leave? But right now, this, you know, we can't have it. They, it's just so, you know, I just don't, I don't think we're done yet at all. I think as long as we keep pushing forward and others push forward and, you know, go those places and pray. You ain't going to get out of the car. You ain't going to, you know, <clears throat> if believers we get together and go these places and at least pray or pray at home for that place. You know, I know some people don't want to get out and do things, but if we just pray, you know, and talk and take those grounds back, take that territory back and not let the enemy have it. I think that there's so much we can do if we just keep pushing forward. You know, if we just keep letting the enemy know that we're not done and Obviously, he knows that because he's fighting against us with everything. But, you know, we just keep pushing forward and keep believing and trusting in Yahweh and <clears throat> look up your redemption draweth not. That's all I have. Shalom. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, very, uh, very good words. Encouragement. And uh, trusting, trusting, uh, that's the important, that's the important word for today, trusting in our master, Yahushua. He has a plan, and he already, uh, before before even the foundation of the world, guess what? Guess what? He had a plan. He knew what was going to happen, and he had a plan ready to go. The devil can't do that. No, our father Yahweh had a plan, and it was ready to go before the foundation of the world. Imagine that. Baruch Hashem. Okay, uh, so uh, what else? Uh, any other comments on this? Let me uh, let me show you this uh, scripture here. I get this over here, Genesis. Okay, all right. So this is in Genesis. This is what I was referencing. Um, okay, so uh, this is in Genesis chapter three, uh, verse fourteen. The master Yahweh said to the serpent, "Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field." On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Look at that. You know that the devil has offspring? Yeah. Between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. That's the crucifixion, my friends. The devil, the devil motivated mankind to put the very lamb of Elohim to death, a cruel death on the cross. But guess what? Their master Yahushua rose again on the third day, showed himself to his disciples. And at the end of showing himself and testifying, he went up into heaven and the disciples were there. They were watching him ascend into heaven. And angels came and they said to them, you men of Judea, why do you stand there looking up above into heaven? Don't you know that in the same manner that Yeshua went into heaven, shall he come again? And this is our blessed hope. He's going to bruise the, the, he, uh, he, uh, the, he will, uh, he is going to crush the head. And this says bruise the seal, but I think it says you will crush the head. Yeah, that's right. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's it right there. He shall bruise your head, and uh, you shall bruise his heel. Okay, uh, so maybe that was not the uh, the translation I wanted, but that's the general idea of what I was trying to communicate there. All right, uh, thank you for those comments. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Yeah. 
Yeah, the children of this uh, it says, are the children of the devil. Go ahead, Jesse. I hear you. Yeah, this is Brother Yeshai here. Um, I was reading in Second Ezra today a very unique portion of scripture that talked about how Ezra had to restore the scriptures on fresh tablets. He was commissioned by Yahweh to do that because the tablets had been, all the scrolls had been burned up and there was no more Torah on the earth. And so Ezra went through this process. And one of the interesting things it says in the scriptures there is that he, he lit up the lamp of understanding inside of Ezra's heart long enough for Ezra to receive the revelation and understanding the power that came from Yahweh to instruct the scribes that, he, that Yahweh had, had appointed uh, to Ezra to rewrite the entirety of Torah. And I found it interesting because Ezra was a very unique set-apart man. I mean, very, very set-apart compared to even to Moshe. And that was, uh, it was like something dawned on me in the Ruach how you know, when it comes to the moving of the Ruach and the different emanations of Yahweh, first there's the preparation of the man. And then, then Yahweh, because the man is prepared, he can turn those lights on inside of us and, and illuminate his Ruach for whatever purpose or reason he needs something to be accomplished. So in reference to um, br the brother who was sharing uh, about the witchcraft going on in the street, like, I, I know the Father once is calling all of us to uh, renew the earth and to declare as ambassadors truth to the world and love and, um, and also come against the principalities of darkness that are residing over certain regions. But I want to caution all of us, myself included, to, to really, we really have to prepare ourselves for some of this stuff because if we're not careful, and we, yes, we have faith. Yes, we have covenant, but we also need to be, we need to be filled by him or, or the, whatever that unique anointing is for the work that he's calling that person to do. It's like, we have to be, the vessel has to be prepared for that, if that makes sense. And that, that's really what I heard of the rock. So I, I, I'm in full agreement. I think that we should be here to shine the light of Yahweh and uh, dispel darkness, banish unclean spirits, free people. Um, but also we, we have to do some internal work to make sure that our vessels are prepared because some of the stuff that is out there is w far beyond in capacity than we can even imagine. And when we confront some of these things, I mean, it'll make the hairs of your, I mean, they could just take your life. There's some of them are so gruesome. <laughs> anyway i mean i realize our elohim is bigger and everything too so i'm not afraid i'm not trying to promote fear or anything but uh, baruch hashem yawa <laughs> shalom <laughs> yeah thank you uh for that brother um i'm reminded of um uh, the scripture that talks about uh, consecrating ourselves unto the master and um uh you know there is a self preparing there is a there is an inner uh, an inner working uh submitting ourselves to the master and i think that's that's an important part of our journey uh such that we can be prepared um uh, for these trials ahead you know the master himself said to his disciples i have many things to tell you uh but i can't tell you right now because you couldn't bear them and so there was a reason why uh he had those years of ministry with the disciples and he had to uh, disciple them and guide them. And even Peter himself denied the master three times, but the master uh, forgave him and uh, gave him the admonition, feed my sheep three times. And look at Peter. He became the one of the great leaders of the called out assembly. Uh, tradition says that uh, when it came time for his execution, because he continued to preach the master Yeshua, and, uh, you know, without fear or favor. And uh, eventually uh, they, they consigned him to death. And he says, look, I'm not even worthy. I'm not even worthy to be crucified in the position that the master Yahushua was. Crucify me upside down. Imagine the sanctification and the, the um, lack of hubris, the lack of, of, of any kind of uh, you know, pride there, 
you know, uh, that he had come to the place to where he was a vessel. And that's all he was, uh, a vessel such that when Peter would walk along the streets of Jerusalem, it's, uh, it's said that his very shadow would cast over sick people and they'd be healed just like that. Imagine that level of sanctification, my friends. Baruch Hashem. Thank you again, uh, Brother Jesse, for that. Uh, Brother Host Apple, you got something? Yes, I was going to um, read a scripture about that, Acts uh, 19 and 16. And the man who whom the evil spirit dwelt leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So exactly what the brother was saying. I mean, if you're not anointed and appointed, you know, and how do I know that? Well, if you feel compelled by Yahweh, the Ruach's compelling you, but don't let the enemy compel you because I've seen people do some strange things and they thought they was anointed. They thought they was ready, but you know, you will get hurt. There, Make no mistake, there is a warfare, a spiritual warfare. And if you are not fasting and praying as the scripture says and you're not ready you know then don't do it but you know i've been to people's houses they asked me to come to their house and they knew things was wrong spirits was there so uh, you know but don't just wake up and think you're gonna walk down some street or some you know don't take on a witch unless you was appointed to do it in other words you know because uh, i've even told people uh down Bay St. Louis, I had a family. It was actually just a friend of the family. And they was like, hey, this child's possessed. And, you know, go down there and just get rid of them. And I'm like, no, you know, the family is doing what the family is doing. And they obviously don't want it out if the family comes forward. But it would be a, a terrible in service to that child and the family because we have to know what we're doing, too. When you run a spirit off, our spirits, you know, when you run the demonic off, if that family is still doing everything they was doing and accepting them back, you're going to bring seven more or they're going to bring seven more. So it's going to be a worse situation, you know, so being we, we got to know what we're doing. You know, we got to be educated in the word and it, it's it all comes together. I know a lot of people think that they're, you know, I have a couple friends that they think they're going to do things and they end up in terrible shape that, you know, they have a lot of chaos going on, but they think that they can go these places and do things. And it, it's all about praying, fasting and knowing, you know, knowing what your limitations are and knowing what Yahweh wants. So definitely, you know, he wants us to definitely take over places and get rid of them. But there's some places the higher, you know, like it said, the the powers that be, and we we don't we're not fighting against the flesh and blood. So not to get that, you know, I'm going to go do something. That pride will get you in trouble and get you hurt. That that haughtiness of I'm doing things as opposed to this is the ruach. This is what Yahweh wants. This is what He's opening this door. And you know, so yes, I would caution people very much. Don't. Don't get prideful. Don't do what we see here. Don't, well, I son this done. I seen that done to just go out there and do it. If you're not prayed up, if you're not anointed, if you don't, you know, know what you're getting yourself into. And for a lot of people, it is taking two or three people, you know, go where two or three are there and praying and doing just what the scripture says. So, yes, I would definitely warn people, don't. You know, I'm not recommending anybody run up tomorrow and start attacking demonics or witches or, and some of these people, there is, I don't think people realize there's a power there. You know, just saying it is one thing, but doing it is another. And if somebody's in that deep that they're, you know, channeling spirits, familiar spirits, then they're not just playing games. It ain't you're actually Ouija board you know, little kids game. It's actually, and not putting that lightly either, but, you know, some of these people have a lot of demonics. They have a lot of power. So, you know, just, just not putting that lightly. I just wanted to throw that out there too. Shalom.
Yeah, thank you, brother, uh, for that. Uh, you know, it kind of reminded me, uh, this is in uh, Acts chapter 19. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is verse 11. And Yahweh was doing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. And their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of Yeshua Messiah over those who had evil spirits, saying, I abjure you by Yeshua, whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of the Jewish high priest Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Yeshua, I know. And Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered them all. I think in the language it says it beat them <laughs> so badly that, that all, it beat them badly and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Imagine, imagine that scene. That must have been quite a beating to where literally their clothes were beaten off of them. And so, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of Yeshua Messiah was extolled. So, uh, important, important to know that you are going with the power and the will and the unction of the Ruach HaKodesh before you get into that kind of ministry uh, and try to cast out demons. And I often believe that it's probably for certain that not everyone has the same gifts and ministries. Let's put it that way. You might not be gifted in that realm, but guess what? Our father has people that are gifted in that realm. And so just make sure you're not stepping into someone else's gifting and realm. <laughs> Melissa, you boys got something to say. Go ahead. Can we see you? Are we okay. Hello. Hey, um, I didn't know that when I was a very early um, convert and I tried to take on demons and I was like, I'm a demon slayer and I got whooped, let me tell you. And then I read the verse where it says, don't cast your pearls before swine lest they turn around and rend you. And I knew that what that meant because these are very powerful poor forces and you have to be like numerous i think to even attempt i wouldn't even attempt now to deal with that at all i just stay away from it i'm like oh i'm not gonna go there yeah well uh if the father's not leading you there you should stay away it's not your ministry uh it's not your gifting uh, but um those who have the ministry and gifting should Walk. Well, we're talking family members and, you know, you think family members, you'd be safe, but then you find out, wow, they're like full of demons. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, the thing about the devil is, is if he can, he will use those closest to us. Look at the master himself. You know, here he walked, talked and did miracles, ate, uh, with his disciples, and yet one of them was a devil, the Bible says. One of them was a devil. That's Judas Iscariot. And uh, the devil, uh, it, it, what he does is he tries to find people that are closest to you. And the wounds uh, that are inflicted by those who are closest to us are the more deeper. And so if you've ever been betrayed out there, my friends, guess what? The master knows how you feel. If you've been betrayed by a spouse, if you've been betrayed by a close friend or relative or confident, uh, if you've been harmed in some way, uh, don't think that your hurt is isolated and alone. The master himself experienced that in the most deepest, intimate way when he took the sop and he attempted, even as a last-ditch effort, to try to, to try to dissuade Judas Iscariot, showing love. I mean, imagine that, the grace and love that the Master Yeshua showed as he, as he took the sop and he offered it to Judas Iscariot. It was 
at the very last moment offering to Judas. And Judas had an opportunity in that moment to repent and turn from his traitorous plan. But the Bible says that he didn't repent. He went out, and it says Satan entered into him. So literally, uh, there is that kind of a pinnacle spiritual moment, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us, uh, when they are confronted with the will and the desire of Elohim. Uh, so we should be sober and careful. Uh, but be willing to take the stripes. Be willing to take the stripes. Of our master Yahushua, this is uh, this is also maturity, I think. So, uh, Yaakov has a uh, comment here. Family can be the most vicious. A prophet is not respected in his own home or country. That's right. That's right. Yeshua was not respected among his own people and country. Uh, and he could and notice that because he wasn't respected, he could do very few miracles there. Very few. Guess what? Where there's disrespect, where there's contempt, where there's evil designs in your heart and in your mind, the spirit of Yahweh is hindered and hampered. This is why it's important that when you're doing ministry to know, to, to know the people around you. They need to be trusted people. They need to be people that 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 have uh, fruits following them, uh, ministry fruits following them, because imagine if you're praying for someone, and 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 this is what's always bothered me about many of the churches. They would pray and they would hold hands. They would hold hands. Well, uh, forget about the occultic overtones of that. The fact that that's what witches and satanists do when they pray to Satan. Forget about that. Think about the scripture that says, lay, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither share in other men's sins. So you need, you need to have discernment when you're doing deliverance ministry. Don't just lay hands suddenly on people uh, because you could share in their sin as well. Uh, and uh, Yaakov, we must not try to harvest before the grain is ripe. That's a good point there. That's a good point. You've got your, you still got your hand up there, Melissa. I guess maybe she doesn't know that. There we go. I'll lower it. All right. Any other comments? I'm what? sorry. Go ahead, brother. Yes, I just want to um, throw that in there that, you know, if you lay hands, if you go against the scripture, you know, you lay hands suddenly on somebody, they might lay hands suddenly back on you, you know. When, when we're going against scripture and doing things that, you know, a lot of that television stuff and a lot of those things we see, these ministries, and they're, you know, laying hands on people and they're all falling about that. You know, a lot of that's just TV land. It ain't what really happens in the spiritual world. And, uh, you know, I'll go back to Melissa there that, you know, if you hear who are you, they don't know you, run. You know, <laughs> it's just, you know, there is a certain uh, anointing. There is a certain, you know, he. we all have different gifts, as you were saying. And I think that's another very unlearned thing that we don't, we don't know what our gifts are. We don't, we kind of have to find them ourselves and kind of trial and error. Does this work or does that work? So I think, you know, a lot of the education, a lot of the learning and going through scriptures is knowing what, where we are, what our lane is, because some people, you know, healings and different things and, and praying and some, you know, there's all the different gifts and the, the anointings that he has and he wants us to do and not saying that, you know, you couldn't ever do that. You know, maybe if you get in a situation or get to a place, we just don't ever count out what Yahweh has for us, what the Ruach wants us to do. But to be very cautious with a lot of this, not, you know, don't to do, not to do things and all that, but to be very cautious with praying for others and especially laying hands and doing things the minute, you know, and that's what uh, a lot of churches 
we go to, we find they're doing things and it's not what scripture says. And then they wonder why their, their healing is not there. And we prayed for a year and, you know, there's a lot of tears behind that people Well, we've been praying for six months and, and nothing's happened, but the fasting, the praying, the, the actually getting a hold of him, you know, is, is something different than what a lot of them understand. They think the pastor's supposed to get up and put his hand out and, and, you know, a lot of that things that they do, uh, you know, they just need to know if they was more educated, if they had more of what the scripture teaches and, and what has to be done and counting the cost, you know, is another thing. You have to count the cost of what you're getting yourself into and what he expects. And it's really obedience. So, Shalom, that's all I got. Uh, thank you for those comments, brother. Uh, you know, as you were speaking, uh, I was reminded of another scripture. Uh, this is in Romans chapter 11. And notice this. Uh, notice that uh, with regard to the gifts and calling of Elohim, and this is actually talking about the house of Judah, but I believe that it applies to, I believe that it applies to anyone, anyone, including, you know, uh, not only fellow believers in Yeshua Messiah, but but even to those outside who are even Gentiles. Look at this. Now this, now this part here is strictly, strictly speaking of the house of Judah. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. That's the house of Judah. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Now, notice this 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 curious statement here. For the gifts and calling of Elohim are without repentance okay is it possible that our father from the foundation of the world appointed people with their gift and their calling in other words there's a there's a gift and a calling that there is a, an eternal hope that they walk into which is appointed to them from the beginning how do i how can i uh perhaps uh, bolster this this claim okay check this out uh, this is in uh, the book of jeremiah okay this is in jeremiah okay uh and look at what uh yahweh says uh this is uh, jeremiah 1 verse 4 then the word of yahweh came unto me saying before i formed you in the belly i knew you do you know that before you were even formed in the belly of your mother, Yahweh knew you and he had a gift and a calling appointed to you before the very foundation of the world. That's how great and awesome our Heavenly Father is. Notice this, and before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. So, this is an important message, uh, and I don't know why the Father's leading me in this direction, but I feel like there's someone out there that's not walking in their calling and apportionment of the gifts of Elohim. They're not walking. They haven't arrived yet. They haven't walked into it yet. And so if that's you out there, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to have the faith to step forward like like that prince of Judah is reputedly had the faith to step forward down into the Red Sea. And at that moment, the, the, the wind picked up and the waves began to part. And the children of Israel walked across dry land, across the sea during their most, um, in, in, that, in that period in the Exodus. So if that's you, just remember, you've got a gift and you've got a calling, a portion done to you before the very foundation of the world. And it's it's the challenge. It's your challenge to find it, come in sync with Father Yahweh and have the faith to walk forward in it. And our master promises us that he will disciple us, that he will disciple us. The Bible tells us 
that literally we have no need of teacher for the Holy Spirit will come upon you and teach you into all things. Have you ever read that? That's a powerful, that's a powerful uh, statement. Uh, for the Holy Spirit will come upon you and guide you in all things. But guess what? You have to submit. You have to give up self-will. You have to submit to his royal kakodesh. Go ahead, Brother Holsapple. Yes, I would second that. You know, a lot of people that they don't know their anointing, they don't know what they're appointed because again, they, they're not educated. Or the, it's not really something that uh, even in church, they don't want you to get out of the pew or to do anything. And what I've found, like, you know, I'm the back pew guy. I'm okay with being on the back pew. Go do whatever you're doing. I'm fine. Just tell me the word. But a lot of that, you know, are those people that are not, they're made to do those things. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, there are just so many thoughts on that, that a lot of people that wouldn't normally be out in the front, that wouldn't want to be out in front, that don't want to, you know, have the limelight or, or whatever. I found a lot of things, um, the radio station that I'm on, I I would have never done that. I, I You know, even when I was approached by the guy who's doing it, I just didn't want nothing to do with it. Who am I to do that? Who am I to, you know... <laughs> Who am I to do something like that? I don't know about that, but it's not always, you don't have to be educated to the point, the Ruach, just like you said there, will lead you, guide you, will will give you what you need to say. So it's not a haughty, you know, I have to be to this certain point and this certain level that a lot of people, I believe that they need to push forward and do those things and they have to get out of that flesh. I, you know, I just don't want to do that or I don't feel like doing that. And the whole time, of course, the enemy and family, you know, is saying, come on, what are you doing? You was raised different. You was raised this way. You was raised that way. And then count the cost because, you know, a lot of my so-called family don't speak to me. They think I bumped my head on something and, you know, and so a lot of places going to church where they go to church and doing things like that is very limited because they don't believe they, you know, they just won't accept anything. They they think they have it all right. And, you know, so there's so much into into this and into. But I would also I'd second that if you're out there and you feel the unction to do it and, you know, to to get and do pray about it. And I had one more verse there that uh, Psalms 105 and 15 says, do not touch my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. So, you know, just like we see there, the enemies, the, the demonics, they know, who are you? You know, I know Yeshua, I know Paul, but who are you? So when we step out of line and we're not known, then we're not known. But, you know, the scripture says, don't, we're not making fun of, or we shouldn't join that, you know, like you had joining hands and join forces and all those things that are demonic, that we need to break those uh, even generational curses. I would say that, you know, there's a lot of things that we just haven't learned and we just don't know that we need to learn. We need to pray. We need to get ourselves right, but don't, not do it because you feel like you're not worthy or don't do it because, you know, there's kind of like that fine line there. Make sure you're called and you're anointed and you probably felt it your whole life. You know, you've always felt you was different. You knew you was different. But if you know that, then you pretty much know he's calling you. So, so long. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, this is in the book of Ephesians 4. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. I, therefore, the prisoner of the master, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So that is the challenge uh, for us today, to walk worthy wherewith the vocation, that being the ministry, that being the ministry wherewith you are called. Guess what? Maybe your ministry is to take care of little children. Maybe your 
a believer that is doing um, child care for other people's children. Wow, what a powerful ministry that you could imp impart something of the master's kindness and love, and maybe even some instruction into those children. Never think that what the Father has called you to do is any greater or lesser, greater or lesser than what the Father has called anyone else. We're all equal, equal in the eyes of the Master. Okay, uh, with all of that, my friends, uh, we've had some wonderful comments. We've had some very good teaching today. And I hope that all of you uh, have been uh, nurtured in the word of Yahushua and by his spirit. And so I'm going to close this now. And I wish all of you a, uh, whether you're keeping Sukkot now, I wish you continued Hag Sameach. Uh, whether you are uh, doing something else, I, I thank you for your participation in the name of Yahushua. Shalom, shalom.